Uh, let me start by thanking Dr. Nossel and all of the organizers for inviting me here today. Uh, it's really great to be back in Kingston after graduating from Queens and RMC a long time ago. Uh, and so uh, I'm back. I'm going to talk about the same subject I was talking about when I left Kingston many years ago, um, which is changing conceptions of how we look at the borders. Uh, and so I want to look at how our perception of the border has changed over time, what this means in terms of uh, what we can say about foreign policy directions today, uh, and then sort of offer a prescription for where we should go um, following this sort of assessment. I'll start by saying that in the post 9-11 period, the concept of homeland security subsumed former conceptions of border security. Uh, so this advent of a so-called new security environment that was oriented towards preventing future terrorist attacks precipitated a fundamental shift in the nature of border security. In the past, we were focused on traditional defense of borders against armed attack by organized military forces. But after 9-11, the emphasis shifted to policing the frontiers against clandestine transnational actors and would-be terrorists. Uh, so the borders were recrafted in a way that involved a thickening of border security efforts that extended beyond formal ports of entry to more distant approaches. I argue that in recent years, border security priorities in the U.S. have undergone a further shift. And in the absence of the arrival of foreign terrorist actors at U.S. border checkpoints, the focus has now shifted towards immigration control that is specifically focused on the state's southern approaches. The current U.S. administration has employed an aggressive rhetoric that I think obscures the real factors that are influencing the need for immigration and asylum reform uh, throughout the Americas. So I want to talk a little bit about the Northern Triangle. In, in an increasingly globalized world, local crises tend to produce regional impacts. And this has certainly been the case in the Northern Triangle, uh, a region that's become known for widespread crime, government corruption and violence following civil wars that started back in the 1980s and that have initiated a legacy of criminality and of fragile institutions. So instability in the region, this region in Central America, which is comprised of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, is arguably one of the most pressing security challenges for U.S. policy in the Western Hemisphere. And according to the World Bank, approximately 49% of Guatemalans, 31% of Salvadorans, and 50% of Hondurans live on less than $5 US a day. There are numerous sources of insecurity in Northern Triangle countries. Following the passage of the 1996 Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, gang members who were imprisoned in the United States were actually transferred back to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras without a clear plan for monitoring, rehabilitating, or reintegrating these violent offenders. Criminal groups, many of which are associated with drug trafficking organizations, operate undeterred in these countries. And I'm sure we're familiar with gangs like the Mara Selva Troika or MS-13 and the 18th Street Gang, more commonly referred to as M18. There are also other regional padillas or street gangs that we need to be concerned with as well. So while previously localized in specific urban areas, these gangs are increasingly moving into rural zones where they pressure or where they pursue rather exclusive control in order to dominate local politicians and to impose their own sense of law and order. As a result of the dominance of these gangs, the Northern Triangle countries are some of the most violent in the world. And according to the Congressional Research Service, in 2017, the homicide rates in these states were 26 per 100,000 in Guatemala, 44 per 100,000 in Honduras, and 60 per 100,000 in El Salvador. Anything over nine is considered to be a high murder rate. So the perpetrators of violence in these countries are often targeting children and youth. The governments of Northern Triangle countries have implemented mano dura or iron fist policies that involve police and military crackdowns, mass incarceration, and neighborhood security forces in an attempt to curb this violence. Uh, but these efforts have, gone, uh, have been largely unsuccessful. Uh, according to a recent study, as many as 95% of crimes in the Northern Triangle go unpunished, uh, and so the public has little trust in the police or state security forces. The three states 
uh, have undertaken complementary efforts as part of their plan of the Alliance for Prosperity in the Northern Triangle. Again, however, to date, these efforts have remained unsuccessful. So as a result of the ongoing violence, the Northern Triangle has become a significant source of mixed migration flows of asylum seekers and economic migrants to the United States. Tens of thousands of people have fled the region and headed north, many of them unaccompanied minors who are seeking asylum from the violence that dominates the region. So what has the US response to the Northern Triangle looked like across successive administrations? Recent uh, administrations have responded to this violence in different ways, but there are common themes that run through these approaches. In the immediate post 9-11 period, President George W. Bush focused on supporting growth and stability in Central America by initiating free market reforms and by increasing trade. The Bush administration awarded hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador through the Millennium Challenge Corporation. In 2005, when rising crime rates led to a surge of northern migration from the region, uh, Operation Streamline was introduced, which served as a zero-tolerance policy under which migrants illegally crossing the U.S.-Mexico border were criminally prosecuted and immediately deported. In its last year, the administration uh, authorized the Merida Initiative, which was a security assistance package for Central America. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that the Bush administration was also responsible for the 2006 Secure Fence Act, which authorized the construction of 700 miles of fencing along the Mexican border. And I actually used to live in El Paso, Texas, and so every morning we would count the number of people who were on the fence in the morning. Um, President Bush stated that the Secure Fence Act would help protect the American people, make borders more secure, and serve as an important step towards immigration reform. And these are ideas that we have heard reiterated in a somewhat different way more recently. Now, upon taking office, the Obama administration rebranded the Merida Initiative uh, into the Central America Regional Security Initiative, or CARSI, after removing Mexico from this group. U.S. strategy for Central America was later revised further to adopt a more holistic interagency approach that prioritized three objectives. First, prompting prosperity and regional integration. Second, strengthening governance. And third, improving security. In 2014, following the initial massive influx in northern migration, President Obama announced that there was an actual humanitarian crisis on the border and he urged Congress to take action on his immigration agenda in light of the surge of migrants from Central America who are seeking to enter the United States. Initially, the Obama administration sought to implement a deterrent strategy that would discourage would-be migrants from undertaking the journey to the United States. Um, and so this was done by rounding up and deporting recently arrived migrants whose asylum claims had been denied in order to dissuade the flow of people to the northern border. Following the 2014 surge of arrivals, however, the Obama administration started to emphasize the humanitarian situation in the Northern Triangle. Despite the humanitarian rhetoric that was used at the time, uh, this also coincided with the initial housing of migrant children in temporary camps on military bases, the push for long-term detention of migrant families while their asylum cases played out in immigration courts, uh, and so while the federal courts ultimately blocked many of these policies, the rhetoric was suggesting the need to emphasize the humanitarian crisis while the actual policies being implemented were still following this deterrent strategy. Concluding that it was in the national security interests of the United States to work with Central American governments to promote economic prosperity, to improve security, and to strengthen governance in the region, the Obama administration ultimately approved a new plan for Central America, the U.S. strategy for engagement in Central America, which involved a whole-of-government approach once again uh, that requested significant increases in foreign aid. The Obama administration also expanded the network of migrant shelters contracted by the Department of Health and Human Services uh, to serve unaccompanied children, and it started to emphasize the need uh, to prioritize migrant families who were sometimes separated in detention. In total, billions of dollars were spent in providing aid to Central America and trying to curb the migrant surge by addressing humanitarian concerns. 
In many respects, the current Trump administration has failed to account for lessons learned by the Bush and Obama administrations in addressing northern migration from Central America. President Trump's populist appeal is frequently fueled by his brash social media presence, where foreign policy proclamations are often released on Twitter. Before coming to office, Trump adopted a hard line on immigration policies, especially those that affect Central Americans. Early electoral speeches emphasized the need to take control of the immigration system uh, in order to prevent so-called undesirables from accessing US resources. Numerous tweets and public statements called for the construction of a mighty border along the country's southern uh, approaches. President Trump has also moved to cut foreign aid to countries like Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And so while initially indicating support for programs aimed at developing prosperity and security in the Northern Triangle, the administration has sought to significantly scale back assistance to the region. However, Congress has rejected the majority of the proposed cuts. In 2019, the President's budget request proposed a 30% decline in assistance to the region compared with the previous year's budget. And so there's still a desire uh, to sort of do away with addressing the humanitarian concerns and instead to focus on the border itself. In December of 2018, uh, President Trump announced the Migration Protection Protocols, more, for, for, uh, more commonly rather con referred to as the Remain in Mexico policy, which is in the news a lot now. Uh, this policy was put into effect at the end of January of this year. Now, while there are conflicting reports, approximately 3,500 to 5,000 Central American migrants were returned to Mexico to await asylum hearings in the U.S. Following a legal challenge in May of this year, which was launched by 11 plaintiffs who attempted to enter the U.S. through a border port of entry in California, uh, in order to claim asylum, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals determined that this program could continue and so remain in Mexico as a policy remains in place. In early March of this year, U.S. Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Kevin McAllen traveled to El Paso, Texas and announced that the border was at a breaking point. He stated that CBP was facing an unprecedented humanitarian and border security crisis all along the southwest border. In the same time period, then Secretary of Homeland Security Kristen Nielsen went to Honduras to address the issues leading to northern migration directly. She met with security officials from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and initiated plans for a new agreement to deal with what she described as a system in freefall. In spite of these efforts, however, the day after her announcement, the president criticized the Northern Triangle countries for accepting monetary aid from the U.S. while, quote, doing absolutely nothing in return. In mid-May, the Trump administration announced plans for a new common sense immigration plan that would replace chain migration with a points-based system. The president said that the plan would stop illegal immigration and fully secure the border, while at the same time establishing a new legal immigration system that protects American wages, promotes American values, and attracts the best and brightest from around the world. So while this new plan addresses northern migration by adding a new section to the wall and modernizing ports of entry, it doesn't address the issue of undocumented entry into the country by potential asylum claimants. Most recently, we've had the announcement of tariffs that were going to be imposed on Mexico. As I was preparing my comments for today, uh, I had to go every morning, look at the news, and then change what I was going to say. And so uh, suffice to say that tariffs have not happened yet, but uh, I haven't checked the news in a few hours, so I'm not sure. So what does this tell us about President Trump's foreign policy? I see three themes that run through President Trump's foreign policy decisions. First is his direct populist appeal to the general public. Many of his border and immigration security policies have been first articulated by tweet. The call to build the wall so crime will fall was initially made on Twitter. There has been a deliberate attempt to represent the views of voters that he argues were left behind by an out-of-touch elite. His rhetoric has been marked by classic populism, where elites are disparaged in order to connect with so-called everyday people. The use of social media platforms like Twitter is a strategy that allows for unmediated access to his supporters and that allows for the bypass of traditional media formats and fact checkers. 
The harsh rhetoric about the need to secure the border and the seemingly novel focus on non-criminal, undocumented immigrants obscures the fact that prior administrations also focused on the deportation of both criminal and non-criminal undocumented aliens. The second foreign policy trend that's visible in the current administration's approach is the direct rhetorical appeal to American self-interest. In his inaugural address, President Trump stated that from this day forward, it's going to be America first. America first. We will seek friendship and goodwill with the nations of the world, but we'll do so with the understanding that it is the right of all nations to put their own interests first. One of the manifestations of the American first strategy has been a preoccupation with bilateral trade deficits. The president's foreign policy rhetoric demonstrates a worldview that sees U.S. alliances as a bad deal that involve Washington bearing the cost and risk of these partnerships while allies reap the benefits. This has been further demonstrated by the attempt to unilaterally determine strategies for addressing northern migration. Finally, the current administration has demonstrated a desire to divorce U.S. foreign policy from any sort of moral foundation. This perspective was directly articulated in the President's speech to the U.N. General Assembly when he asked the world to choose a future of patriotism, prosperity, and pride. The administration's current rhetoric describing the influx of migrants from the Northern Triangle has focused primarily on the challenges of dealing with undocumented arrivals, and it's largely ignored the socioeconomic in, uh, factors rather that have fueled this migration pattern. So in this sense, it can be argued that President Trump has further accelerated a trend in foreign policy that's signaling Washington's retreat from humanitarian responsibilities, which is something that we've talked about already today. So, my big argument here is that there is a need for asylum reform in the Americas. The responses of successive administrations to the influx of migrants from Central America demonstrates the need to reform the North American immigration system in order to address the security challenges that are posed by Northern immigration. First, there's a need to reassess the role that human smuggling plays in the North American asylum process. Many of the irregular migrants traveling to the U.S. from Central America rely on some sort of human smuggling network. One estimate found that human smuggling operators facilitating northern migration made somewhere between $200 million and $2.3 billion, with a large share of that profit ending up in the hands of transnational criminal organizations with ties to the illegal drug trade. There is a clearly demonstrated need for the U current U.S. administration to make changes that would effectively speed up the asylum claim process. The surge of migrants from the Northern Triangle has created a massive backlog in the immigration courts. The system is overwhelmed and there are more than 850,000 cases and only 424 judges. The current policy of metering which involves sending uh, would-be asylum claimants to Mexico uh, and then allowing in a certain number per day in order to uh, attend their asylum hearings is ineffective. Um, and the number of asylum cases has more than quadrupled since 2010. So clearly there are reforms that are needed to make this system more efficient. The current backlog in the asylum queue serves as an incentive for more would-be migrants to file asylum claims that allows them to enter the U.S. and then to wait out their hearings. Finally, I argue that a definition of a well-founded fear of persecution common across North America would ensure that all asylum claims are judged fairly and would ensure that the system is more equitable and more effective. Many of the migrants are, who are fleeing the Northern Triangle region are seeking to escape violent gangs that target women, children, and young unaffiliated adults for extortion and violence. Uh, as such, upon arrival at the U.S. border, they're filing asylum claims on the basis of a well-founded fear of persecution in their country of origin. In 2014, the Board of Immigration Appeals ruled that violence on the basis of gender, sexuality, or resistance to gang activity met the threshold for a well-founded fear of persecution. However, others have disagreed with this finding, arguing that the violence faced by those from Central America is generalized and does not meet the convention threshold. In June of last year, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions declared that gang violence and domestic violence are not grounds for asylum. Uh, but it's important to note that the U 1951 UN Convention enshrined the right to seek asylum, but not the right to asylum in any particular country. 
And so sovereign states have the right to determine for themselves what constitutes a well-founded fear of persecution. The establishment of a common definition for this criterion that is common across North America, so in Canada, the United States, and Mexico, would be the first step in establishing a more effective asylum system. So just to sort of sum up, to date, Canada has not taken a firm stance on addressing the northern flow of migrants from the Northern Triangle region. It's cut off from Central America. Mexico is serving as the gateway, and so it has remained the focus of this influx of migrants. However, I think it would be in Canada's best interest to participate in an overhaul of the North American asylum system uh, so that we are not facing either more bilateral trade issues uh, or other repercussions from sort of not towing the, the common line on this. And it also helps to promote human security initiatives as well by ensuring that there is a common definition that's being applied to individuals seeking to enter North America.